Hallelujah. This is Resurrection Sunday. And while every Sunday and every day reminds us that Jesus is alive, this is the day that we do get to say to one another, the Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. He's risen indeed. Amen. Let's uh, pray together. Lord, we dedicate this Resurrection Sunday to you and ourselves to you as well. We want your resurrection life to flow through us, to energize us, to drive us forward in belief, in decision and commitment, and in hope. We set uh, this day as we set every second of our lives aside unto you for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We uh, conclude today our study of the Gospel of Mark that's been from winter to spring and now to this Resurrection Sunday. And our passage for today is Mark uh, chapter 15, verses 42 through chapter 16, 8. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone was in. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You pray now. Oh, I can pray now. We are changing the dance card. Lord, we do on this Resurrection Sunday bow before you, and we give you thanks and praise. What a world we would be in, how much darker it would be than the darkness that rattles us now to not have hope, to not have hope in your divine and supernatural power, to not have hope in the resurrection from the dead. Lord, to look at your resurrection and see the absolute affirmation from our God and Father that your sacrifice was accepted, that we can relate to you not based on our performance, but based on your forgiveness. To know that our eternity with you is secure. From that place of personal and individual salvation, we have a hope for the coming of the kingdom of God, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, for the peace that's available to us in our hearts to be able to break out into our world. Lord, we pray this day for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for peace in the hearts of individuals whose hearts are full of the same kind of turmoil and conflict that brings the darkness and destruction that hangs over these days we live in now. We thank you 
that we are not people without hope, but we are a people for whom hope is also born anew every day, for whom mercies are renewed every morning because our God is great and faithful. We bow before you now with confidence. We bow before you now with hope. We bow before you on this Resurrection Sunday, celebrating your resurrection and our hope for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our God, our strong deliverer.
Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Joe. One of the most unusual perspectives on the resurrection of Christ uh, comes from uh, convicted Watergate's conspirator Chuck Colson. And here's what he writes. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, or put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate involved 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and we couldn't keep a lie together for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie a conspiracy for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. As we end our study of Mark on this Resurrection Sunday, we looked at that first Easter weekend when the women came to the tomb and they found it empty. And they had an angel announced to them and in many ways give them the marching orders of the church. He is risen. Jesus was not a martyr, but a savior. For those uh, who have been here throughout the study of Mark, we have to remind ourselves on this day, as we looked at the cross, that the same Jesus who we saw throughout the gospel, who demonstrated divine power, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who calmed the storm at sea, that same Jesus is the one who died a very horrible and human death on the cross. He wasn't there because he had been outmaneuvered. He wasn't there because he gave up. He wasn't there because he was overpowered. He was on that cross because he chose to be. The resurrection of Christ was necessary to establish that fact, that his work was done, that God approves of what he did. You and I can now have a relationship with God that's based on Christ's payment for our sins and not based on our good works, not based on our performance, based on his forgiveness 
not our performance. That's the heart of the gospel. And the gospel stands on this foundation that Jesus died for us and was raised from the dead according to the scripture. In this passage, we begin to see the disorientation of his followers through these women and then the reorientation of those followers. When we do archaeology in the Mideast, people will look at a, a mound of ruins 70 feet high uh, that might comprise 20, 30 different cities. And they'll ask, how can you tell them apart? And part of the answer is orientation. When you're digging and the walls run this way, you know, people don't like to live in rooms that are six inches wide and 200 feet long. We have a, a natural sense of space and size. And so as, as the stubs of the walls come out and everything's in orientation, you're going through and you're continuing your excavation. And suddenly, in the middle of the floor, another wall appears. And instead of running this way, it's going this way. And a couple rooms over when there's another wall parallel to it and you start clearing away those walls that you'd been digging through for so long, that layer of the city that you'd become familiar with, and you suddenly see everything lying on a new axis, everything in a new orientation, you know that some dramatic historical event has happened. That uh, a city has fallen or even a civilization has fallen and now there is a new orientation. One of the dramatic evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reorientation of his disciples and followers to, from being disoriented and shattered and demoralized to being reoriented and animated and determined and committed with absolute to the death kind of commitment. As Chuck Colson said, the 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Christ, including his own up to that point unbelieving brothers, adopted a new orientation and message. And not one of them turned back in denial and doubt. On a smaller scale, these 12 followers, the women who were at the cross, this little more than a score of people on the first resurrection of Sunday, show that something unusual happened. The fact that 2,000 years later, in almost every country on the planet, certainly on every continent of the planet, and I'm confidently even Antarctica, people are today remembering and commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is too widespread to be a hallucination. This is too heavily opposed and researched to be a hoax. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best atten uh, attested and authenticated miracle in history. The resurrection of Christ is what our Easter celebration every year is about. That's the what of Easter. But that leaves another important question unanswered. The so what of Easter. What does it mean to me today? And I think we can begin to answer the so what question by looking at three opportunities that the resurrection gives to us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crossroad of faith and history. Faith traveling in one direction, history traveling along in its own direction, and at a certain point they touch, and for Christians especially, we're at a crossroad, and it brings us an opportunity. And here are the three opportunities that I'd like to outline for you today. The first is we have the opportunity to believe. As I said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best attested miracle 
of history. Now, by their nature, miracles are unscientific, right? Science is all about uh, repeatability. It's all about being able to uh, experiment. Miracles, by their very nature, aren't subject to those rules of science. We can't pull together all the pieces again and have another resurrection of Jesus. By definition, miracles are those things that stand outside of our scientific structures, outside of our scientific methods. It is, by definition, unrepeatable by us using the natural forces and uh, even hypotheses that we have available to us. Now, Christ's resurrection only needed to happen once because Jesus only needed to die for our sins once. An infinite sacrifice for a finite period of time so that we as finite beings might not have to pay the price for our sins for an infinite period of time. There's a balance to that spiritual equation of the universe. The majority of cultures have always depended upon written accounts and verbal testimonies, not upon experimentation, not upon uh, replaying the event in order to demonstrate it. And so we have multiple witnesses. We have the written testimony, and that places us as 21st century Americans, as 21st century human beings, in a position where we have to then face an opportunity, an opportunity to believe or not. Now, in our Western world especially, we've all become kind of passive about belief. We want faith to happen to us. We want it to kind of fill our hearts while we sit back as quiet spectators. But as it's portrayed in the Bible, believing is something that is active. Believing is something that comes out of not just the heart and emotions of a person, the passions of a person. It comes out of the thoughts of a person. It comes out of the will and choice of a person. We uh, believe in many things, right? Many, uh, some of us believe in some leader. Some of us believe in a certain dream that pulls us forward. We believe in a relationship or a marriage or a spouse. We uh, believe in our children. There are things we do. It seems like we do that so naturally. We don't know the effort that comes when we start at a small point and it grows until it's something that just consumes our heart and our mind and our passion. Faith in Jesus is the same kind of thing. It, it begins with that small step. It begins with actually what the second opportunity talks about. It begins with that that decision we make, that decision to respond to who Jesus says he is, who his followers said he was, who the scriptures say he is. You and I can't dismiss this story, this story of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, it's one of the most critical issues in world history and culture for the past 2,000 years. It has spawned benefits it has spawned abuses. It has spawned triumphs, and it has spawned tragedies, tragedies. But sooner or later, everyone has to decide about this story. Uh, in the Western, in so much of the Western world, whether we talk about A.D. or B.C. or we talk about C.E. or B.C.E., it divides our calendars. It makes a, a center for history. The story of who Jesus is, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, becomes something that we are forced into making a decision about. Now, I can go to uh, Jerusalem with you, and we can go around, and we can look at the ruins, and we can look at the monuments, we can look at the memorials, we can go to the archives and the libraries. Uh, we can sit and read the histories that come to us and all of the literature that's been developed around those stories, around those testimonies. But when it's all finished, I know what I will believe. I know what I believe. And 
on that journey, you would be put in a position where you would decide whether or not you believe, whether or not you live in a world with or without hope. And that's the, the third opportunity that the resurrection of Jesus brings to us, is the opportunity to find hope. If, if the universe is a closed system, if there are no spiritual realities or metaphysical existence, then I really can't kind of create a basis for hope. But if God showed us, if only one time, if God showed us that there is more to life than our bodies, if he showed us there's more to the universe than matter and energy, that there's more to existence than things that can just be dismantled uh, through scientific knowledge and approach, if he showed us there's not just the physical, but there is the metaphysical, there is the spiritual. If just once he showed it, and he showed us more times than once, but certainly no more dramatically than the resurrection of Christ, then there is no hope. But if the world is put together differently, if it's more than just what we can see and analyze, if, if we the quiet moments of our soul when faith stirs and spirituality intersects with history and the mundane realities of physical life, if in those moments we listen to that and then we look at the resurrection of Christ and we actively believe, we, as the second point says, decide to believe, we make that choice, then we find hope. We find uh, hope for his hand to end some pain in our lives that's never gone away. We find hope for meaning and satisfaction that we've never found. We find hope for a new start in a relationship or a marriage. We find hope for seeing those we have loved who have gone before in faith and to see them living beyond the realm of flesh. We see them living in eternity. That was the, what the great benefit, the, the building, the edifice that starts to grow over the foundation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the core of the gospel. Those are the opportunities that come to us to engage, to be reoriented, and to be filled with a faith and hope that defines and for, I guess, as we believe, redefines life. The women, and I love the way that, that the key players in the resurrection story, the, the heroes of the crucifixion, maybe if you expand and look at history, the heroes of history altogether are, are women, right? And we shouldn't be surprised then that here at the resurrection event, there are these women who come in grief and disorientation and then are moved to amazement and surprise and then beyond that to be reoriented in a commitment that lays the foundation of a faith that's still spreading in the world and in our hearts today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crossroad, the intersection of faith and history. And like all crossroads, when we come there, we choose the path to take. We choose and make a decision about this story that's been preserved and shared and faithfully proclaimed for 2,000 years. He is not here. He is risen. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow before you on this Resurrection Sunday. We travel across space and time. We move the calendar 2,000 years, and we move our geographical location 6,000 miles or so, and we join those women, making their way through a garden just out the si outside the walls of Jerusalem. We come up to that rocky, stony, 
hill with the tomb, the brand new tomb carved in its side. And then we hear the words of the angel telling us that he's not here. That he is going before us, before them to Galilee, but before us as, as our guide and leader and orientation for all of our lives. We hear that story, and in this moment, we respond. We respond with curiosity. We respond with doubt and struggle. Or we respond with the affirmation of faith that says, yes, Jesus is alive. He died for me that I might know life eternal. That I could bathe in his forgiveness and have a relationship with him based solely upon that. Lord, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. And we thank you for the hope that is inspired in us through your resurrection and continued life. We dedicate, not just this day, but every first day of the week, every Sunday, every other day, to the Lord who is risen and able to live in our hearts today. And we do this in your name. Amen. Thank you.